Well, a very good morning to everyone. I'm starting out here and while um, Dick is playing our um, uh, opening music, I'm gonna run to my office because um, I forgot my, my microphone. Uh, I'm not used to, I'm not a morning person. For those who have not figured this out over the past 10 years, I'm not a morning person and all the coffee in the world is not going to make me a morning person. So um, uh, when you see me run out, there's no problem. I will be back in, I promise, um, because it's worth coming to. We have a wonderful service this morning. It might be early, but you know, God is a God of all times. And so um, it doesn't matter. In fact, um, the greatest thing that ever happened in the Christian faith happened at sunrise when the women came out to the tomb and realized that the tomb was empty. And so in a way, we all ought to be mourning people. Um, uh, God hasn't seen fit to uh, give all of us that, um, that trait, however. So um, uh, let us welcome one another this morning. And if you're so inclined, um, turn around and I don't know who has gotten up at this hour, but even if they're not with us live, they'll see us later. So uh, let's let's welcome one another this morning. All right, and let us begin with our opening music. I'm back up and running. Um, as far as announcements, um, uh, the biggest one, um, well, two biggest ones. The first is last call for Christmas pageants. Um, uh, anybody who wants to be in the Christmas pageant, um, there are still roles for stars and barn animals. Um, and this is an all age. Um, uh, clearly, uh, we don't need any pumpkins, um, unfortunately, but um, if we did, 
And for those of you at home, my apologies, but um, huge, huge shout out this morning for the one person who actually took me up on the, you can wear ha ha uh, Halloween costumes. Marsha Christmas dressed up like the cutest pumpkin I have ever seen. These are the times when I wish that we had, we technically do have manual control over the camera, but um, not, oh, did you get her? No, okay. Um, uh, but um, yes, we, we will have um, uh, wonderful costumes for everyone. They, they just won't look like that. Uh, so talk to me uh, about that. Um, the other one, obviously, the, um, the reason that we're all here at this um, our early hour is uh, because of the chicken barbecue, which um, you probably drove in, saw cones. Um, Mark is back there. And Mark told me that he's dressed as roadkill today. Um, um, you know what you need, Mark, you need a, um, a tire across your, you know, you're missing the, you look too clean. On the fire department, we used to make fun of people who looked that clean. Uh, oh, okay, okay, I got it. I, I, I decided to take most of my costume off because I didn't think it was appropriate to stand up here looking like a wizard from Harry Potter. Uh, some people are, are kind of, but I do have my Ravenclaw tie on, which um, interestingly goes very, very well with this, um, with this robe. Um, so um, the other thing that I want to do is a shout out to Jim Mullet, who celebrates his birthday this coming Thursday. So um, happy birthday, Jim. And um, other than that, we are ready to um, get you involved in our service. So I invite you to stand up either in uh, body or in spirit and let us share together verses one and three of him 661, all people that on earth do dwell. you to continue in our worship uh, as we begin with prayer to God. Come into the land of God. Live as the people of Christ. Follow in the ways of the Lord and in love let us pray. Oh God, you are our God. And we come as your people on earth. Gather us in so that we might remember the ties that bind us together in your love. Write your law upon our hearts and forgive us for the times we go astray. Strengthen us by your spirit and empower us to live as your children of love. Amen. Now, we don't have any kids here in the sanctuary, but that doesn't mean that we all don't have um, a kid inside of us. And because we have a hybrid worship situation now, it also doesn't mean that there might not be kids either joining in at this hour or joining in later. And so, oh, I'm sorry. Do you want to come on up? We do have. You don't have to. You don't. Okay. No? Okay. 
You're at that, you're at that age. You're like, I don't know if I really want to, I kind of feel like too old for that. I'll get you a sucker anyway. How about that? All right. Very good. Well, the, um, uh, the message that I had for all of us, um, the kids and, and, and the kids inside of each of us, was, um, was a message about something that many of you have probably already done. How many of you have carved a jack-o'-lantern in preparation for Halloween today? All right. So, so you know the procedure, right? I, I didn't do it myself. I, I just kind of ran out of time. Never even got a pumpkin, to be honest, except for the couple of ones that I grew in my garden, which are really too small uh, to do much with. Um, and I'm not as practiced as it is I might be because this was not one of the things my mom liked when we were growing up. And what she didn't like about it is that, I mean, let's face it, carving a pumpkin is messy, isn't it? If it was just a matter of making the design on the front and cutting out the eyes and the nose and the mouth or whatever else design that you decide to have, whether it's happy or scary or something else, it, it, you can't do that until you do something else, right? You got to do the yucky part first because there's gross stuff down inside a pumpkin. Anybody not know that when you first opened it up and you looked inside and you went, whoa <laughs> this is what my mom didn't like about it at all was the gross stuff now of course kids we love that right i mean the goopier the nastier the better especially i'm sure in the doster household it's just a matter of please don't fling it at one another right yep yep um you scoop all of that out because because there's got to be room for light right i mean what's a jack-o-lantern if you don't put a light in it and, and I'm sure that some of you adults have seen this because this goes around Facebook every single year. But the reality is, is that we're a lot like those pumpkins. We have yucky stuff inside of us, too. It, it's not goopy and stringy. And to my knowledge, there's no seeds involved. Um, but there's stuff inside of us that, that God needs to not be there. There's stuff inside that's going to get away, get in the way of the light that God wants each of us to shine out into the world. And so some of this yucky stuff, it's like, it's like pride. It's, it's ego. It's jealousy. It's uh, prejudice. It's hatred. Uh, sometimes we're hanging on to old things and we're not willing to forgive. And those old things, those hurts, those, those grudges, they make things yucky inside of us. And so what God really wants to do is what, what many of you have already done with your pumpkins. God wants to help us scoop all of that stuff out. Because just like a pumpkin doesn't have room for the light, if you don't scoop that yucky stuff out, if you don't do the work of clearing it out, we're not going to have room for God's light to live in our hearts and shine out into our world, a world that is living in darkness and needs our light. And we won't have room for that. If we don't scoop out all of that other yuckiness, if we don't forgive, if we don't let go of our pride, if we don't let go of our anger and whatever else it is that's getting in the way of letting God's light shine through us. So we can think about that whenever we see a pumpkin. And, and maybe it makes the, doing the yucky part not quite so yucky. It's still going to be goopy and stringy. Uh, but the good news is you can, um, what we used to do when we were kids, you can dry out the seeds and then string them and make stuff for the, um, uh, the Christmas tree or plant them the next year, which is probably a little more practical. Um, but either way, Yet again, God has given us a wonderful reminder of how God works within us and helps us to become the people that God has meant to, means for us to be, because we are created to shine God's light, just like the jack-o'-lantern is. So let's pray. God, thank you so much that you created us to not to live with all of our insecurities and, and all of the stuff that prevents us from being your light in the world, but that you help us to get rid of all of that stuff, not literally to scoop it out like we do with a pumpkin, but to clear it out so that our hearts are free from all of those things that get in the way of us being able to shine your light. God, if there is anything left in our lives that does need clearing out, let us know and show us the ways that we can clear that out. Because ultimately, God, what we want is to be able to shine your light 
into the dark corners of our world because your light is your love. And we want everyone to know that light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. And I will I will we'll make arrangements for um, suckers afterwards. Okay, perfect. Good morning. Today's reading is from Psalm um, 119, verse 1 through 8. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks, Sarah. Our sermon scripture today comes from the Old Testament, one of the first five books of the Bible, often attributed to Moses, um, and certainly Moses lived many of these throughout his life. They were probably written down afterwards, but it doesn't make Moses's authorship any less accurate. Today, we're looking at the great commandment, and we think of that as something that Jesus said. But long before it was ever on Jesus's lips, God shared it with Moses, and then Moses shared it with the Jewish people. We find this great commandment in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, verses one through nine. Moses speaks to the people and he says this. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you were at home and when you were away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. God, we do give you thanks. There, there is so much to give you thanks for. We go over all of the blessings in our mind and we realize that you are continually blessing us and caring for us. We know too, God, that your word is part of that blessing. And so we ask that you would open our hearts through your Holy Spirit to receive your word and to understand how it lights up our lives so that we might live it and light up the lives of others. Amen. How many of you are familiar with an author named, I always get this wrong, Robert Fulgram? There's no R, Robert Fulgham. All right, let, okay, Mary Kay. I should have known. Um, uh, I knew I could count on you. Robert Fulgram, Fulgram, Fulgham wrote a number of books, but I'll bet that while you might not recognize the name, you may recognize the title of his first collection of works, a title that was on the New York Times bestseller list for nearly two years. Tom has already had a guess. I'll see if it's right. 
All I really need to know I learned in kindergarten. Yes, Don wins. Although Mary Kay beat you to the gold star because she knew ahead of time. Now, how many people have heard of that book? Yeah, a lot more people. Uh, I guess he didn't get credit quite for his namesake, but we know the book he wrote. And like I said, a lot of people know it because for nearly two years, it was a bestseller. There are other books, but and I have a couple of them, but that book stands out. I have a copy of it at home and it's well worn if I'd have brought it in because I've looked it over several times, even though it was published years ago, so long ago, we don't even remember the author's name. It contains such wonderfully simple and yet profound lessons that this easy book of coll a collection of lessons is just so wonderful to uh, to read and to go back over. Now, if you've never heard of it, or if you're trying to remember some of it in your life, uh, or for those who were probably not even born when uh, the author wrote this particular book, basically the premise uh, of, the, um, of the book are all of this collection of lessons. And the, um, the lead, of course, as the title betrays, are lessons that we learned in kindergarten. Oftentimes we think of kindergarten as, okay, well, I, I learned to color within the lines, um, but, but kindergarten is kind of a throwaway. Now it's not. The things that the kids live and learn in kindergarten today kind of blow my mind. I don't think I learned some of those things until at least first, if not second grade, and they're learning them in kindergarten now. But a lot of the things that we learned in kindergarten, if you recall, and as the author recounts, are things like be nice to one another. Put something back if you take it. Say you're sorry if you hurt somebody. And these are some of the lessons that he talks about that really are viable, not just in kindergarten, not, not just when we're in childhood, but throughout our lives. And I got to thinking about this this week as I was looking at this lesson that for Jesus and for all of his followers would have been something that they would have learned from a very young age. This, um, this reading that I read from you from, from Deuteronomy, it kicks off all of the rest of the laws that God gave to Moses. And so Moses kicks off his giving of the laws by sharing this particular, not only command, but the statement ahead of it. The whole thing, starting in verse four, for our Jewish friends is a prayer that is central to their faith. They refer to it as the Shema. S-H-E-M-A, which is a Hebrew word that means here, as in here, O Israel, the beginning of the prayer. And, and as you heard, God commands people to keep this prayer and the lesson that it holds central in their lives. And our Jewish friends do that. They do everything that we've talked about. Every synagogue service starts out with the recitation of this prayer. Observant Jews recite this prayer in their lives twice a day, every single day, no matter who they are, not just rabbis, but everyone. And those who are Orthodox, they wear straps, and there will be little boxes attached to the straps on their hands and on their foreheads when they're praying. And in those boxes will be this prayer. And if you've ever been to a Jewish home or a Jewish hotel, if you visited the Holy Land, you might have seen something like this up on the doorway if you were paying close attention. This is called a mezuzah. I picked it up when we were in Israel. And it's on every doorway of every Jewish home. But it's not just a decoration because there's a cavity in the back. And rolled up in that cavity is a parchment. And among a few other things on that parchment, you guessed it, is this prayer. And so literally in keeping with the commands of God, and given by Moses, our Jewish friends keep this prayer, this commandment to love God with everything that we have, keep it central in, in our lives. But Jesus reiterated this prayer, didn't he? Jesus shared this same commandment when the rich young man asked him what was the greatest commandment. The question about what was the greatest commandment was a frequent discussion among rabbis. So it was not an unusual question to ask Jesus about. Although, as per usual, they were also trying to trip him up a little bit 
and find out if he would say something wrong that they could use as ammunition against him later. Jesus began by quoting this very command that you should love the Lord your God with all, your, all of your whole self. And then, of course, he added another command from, that we find in Leviticus, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said that upon these two commands hang all the law and all the prophets. And so clearly, we are meant as Christians to make this particular command, at least the command, if not the whole prayer, central in our lives too. So does that mean that we should be having mezuzahs hanging everywhere? Not necessarily. In fact, I think that there are other ways to keep the lesson of this particular command. And I came up with a fun way for you to remember it today. Now, I started out talking about all I need to know I learned in kindergarten on purpose, because the way that I came up for you to remember what God wants you to know, and all of us to know from this particular command, we can learn it from the hokey pokey. Now, I know that sounds strange. Some of you are thinking, I get up early for this. <laughs> well, you got up early for this. You remember how the song goes, right? You can join me if you want. I'm not going to sing this. I'm just going to speak it. So you start out, you put your right arm in, you put your right arm out, you put your right arm in, and you shake it all about. I don't think I can do this on my little stool. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself around. That's what it's all about. Right? You're all looking at me like I've got two heads this morning. But you remember that? How many people have done the hokey pokey? Either as kids as or an adult. Yep, see, almost every single. This, the hokey pokey bridges generations. We had people from every generation raising their hand. We've been doing the hokey pokey. I looked it up since like the 1800s. This song has been about. And of course, it was a fun way to um, get up and moving around with your friends on the playground, wasn't it? Because it's not just your right arm that you put in, then it's your left arm, then it's your right leg, then it's your left leg, then it's your head, then it's the thing that always made all the kids giggle because you put your backside in. And then, you know, that was just, we mostly giggled through that verse. And then lastly, we do what? We put our whole self in. That's the key to this command. That's exactly what God is asking Moses to tell the nation of Israel to do. And it's what Jesus wants us to do. Loving the Lord your God with everything that you have means putting your whole self in. It's really the same thing that we did in the hokey pokey. It's about what level of commitment do we have in our relationship with God? How much are we willing to really live out our love for God? Not just in our hearts, not just walking around silently loving God, but how much are we willing to be a living expression of God's love? Are we, like many people do, just kind of putting an arm in? Or maybe our head? Is it just a Sunday morning thing? Or are we all in? with God? Are we willing to jump into that circle and put our whole selves in when it comes to our commitment to living God's love in our world? That's how we let our light shine, by truly living out this command. And this is something that we can do without mezuzahs and without phylacteries, which is what those straps and little boxes are called. This is how we can do exactly what God calls, to recite them to our children and talk about them when we are at home and when we are away. That when we lie down and when we rise, bind them as a sign, maybe not on our hands or on our forehead or on our doorposts, but on our hearts and on our lives. On the way we live, everything that we do is how we can be all in, put our whole selves in with God. It's how we can know that God is our God alone, and then love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength. The scripture says might, but it's the same thing. And basically what God is doing here is he is describing the entire person. When we talk about our, our heart, which was the heart of the person, the essence of who they were, the soul, the spiritual essence of the person, 
and then all their strength. And then Jesus adds in another one, all of our mind, just in case there was any doubt as to it being the whole person. Our Jewish friends have found ways, literally according to the scriptures, to make this prayer, this command, central to their lives and to their faith, to keep it ever in front of them. And we would do well to do the same thing, to find ways to make this simple yet sometimes difficult to live out command central in our lives, to be all in like we were on the hokey pokey. And here's the best part. It doesn't require doing the hokey pokey, which I was never really sure exactly what that was anyway, or turning yourself about, which would make us dizzy all the time. It also doesn't mean that being all in for God means that you've got to sit in church all the time, which is a good thing because I don't have a lesson for you all the time. I don't even have time to sit in church all the time. I know there are some people who think that I live here, and there are some weeks that it feels like I live here, but I really don't. We can't possibly be in church all the time, nor can we be sitting around praying and meditating all the time. Oh, sure, God calls some people to that lifestyle, that monastic lifestyle, that that's all that they do. But the question for the rest of us who are called to different roles in life, different vocations, is how do we do what we're being asked to do? How do we keep this lesson, this command central in our lives? How do we continually remind ourselves to keep God's love foremost in all that we do, to influence our decisions and to guide our steps? Well, we do it in a, in a less literal way than our Jewish friends, but we do it nonetheless. We simply do it as a matter of attitude and perspective. It's a matter of priority. As in so many things throughout the scriptures, it's not really about what we're doing as to how we're doing it. We don't have to follow these commands precisely. We don't have to have mezuzahs on our houses. But we do. If we truly want to be the people of God that we're being called to be, we do need to write them on our hearts. We do need to be all in for God. And we do that simply by taking Jesus's lessons, his examples, everything that he lived is this command. Loving God with everything that we have means making God a priority in our life and not just God, but God's love. So that all the decisions that we make, whether they're religious or secular, are done through the lens of God's love. When we're raising our children, when we're attending meetings, when we're working on papers for school, Whatever it is that we do in our everyday lives, whatever it is that we're called to, when we do all of that through the lens of God's love, then we will be living according to Jesus' teachings. We will be following in his footsteps, and we will be living according to this command. And then not only will we be blessed by our efforts, but others will be as well, because then we will also be that light that I spoke of earlier in the children's time. We will be shining the light of God's love through us as we make God the central part of our life, as we go all in, put our whole selves in to our commitment to live out God's love. It's not the most difficult thing we'll ever be asked to do in our life. There are challenges. Of course, the world wants us to be other ways. Sometimes it's not the most convenient. Sometimes we might have to stand up to people and say, no, I, you know what? That's not what I believe. That's not how I want to do it. Sometimes jumping into that circle, metaphorically speaking, and being all in for God means standing up for God. Living according to God's love sometimes means saying no. And sometimes that can be as difficult as it was for Peter when he had to stand up for Jesus. Peter failed. But we don't need to, because we can learn from his lesson and we can learn from the lessons of all of those others before us. We can jump into that circle and put our whole selves in for God. So you see, Robert Fulgram, whether I can pronounce his last name correctly or not, really was right. Everything we need to know, really, we did learn in kindergarten, in school, in our childhood, on the playground, those lessons that we thought were just fun. God can teach us a lot about our lives.
And not just about how to live our lives so that we can be happy, but how we can live our lives all in for God so that we can make a difference in our world. I promise you, if you're willing to make the commitment, it is as easy as that song. Put our whole selves in. Just don't take your whole self out. No hokey pokey, no turning yourself about. But the last line is true. That's what it's all about. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. You know, trying to remember to wear this microphone, I always have to make sure that I turn it off. Um, because while I love to sing, that's not what you want to hear coming through the, um, the speakers. Um, there are many ways that we can jump into the circle and put our whole self in for God. Only one of those is giving back to God. Sometimes we give back through the talents that God has given us, as many people will do this afternoon and have already done baking brownies and making ready for our chicken barbecue. Sometimes we give back through our time, as again, people do all the time here at St. Paul's in so many ways. And sometimes we do by giving back our treasures, those financial gifts that God has blessed us with. We may have earned and worked the job, but God opened the doors. God blessed us with the resources and God made all things possible. And so now we give back to God from what we have received. So will the ushers come forward for this morning's offering.
God, we do give you thanks and we praise your holy name for all that you have given us. These are a mere fraction as we give back to you part of our blessings. We acknowledge you and give you thanks even as we ask you to bless these gifts and use them to further build up your kingdom as you have in our hearts. Use the our gifts to build up your kingdom in the hearts of others and in our world. Amen. Thank you all. All right, as we come to our time of prayer today, um, we do have a few prayer requests. Um, the first, um, I'd ask that you would join me in continuing to pray for the family of Jacob Wadsworth. Um, I know that that's probably not a name that's necessarily familiar to a lot of people here, but um, uh, Jacob was a young man who um, had demons that he wrestled with throughout his life, and um, his life ended way too early uh, last Sunday. And uh, so I was, I had the privilege of attending his funeral service at the Methodist Church in Clyde. Um, his adopted father is um, good friends with Lori Williams, um, who I sat with. And uh, so I would ask that you would keep um, David, his father, and also Vanessa and Jackie in your thoughts and prayers as they grieve Jake's loss and all of his friends. The, the church was packed with young people. It was, it was both beautiful and tragic all at the same time. I'd also ask that you keep uh, the family of Earl Daniel in your uh, prayers. Earl passed away on Friday. Um, Earl was ready. I had the privilege of uh, spending time with Earl in some of his last days. Uh, we even watched a uh, part of an Indians game together. Um, that game didn't turn out like either one of us would have hoped. So maybe Earl can uh, pull a few strings up there in heaven. I don't know. Um, although, you know, honestly, um, if, um, if Denny couldn't do it, nobody can. Um, so um, I don't know. We'll keep maybe, maybe uh, the more hands, the better. Uh, speaking of Jackie, uh, Jackie is also back in the hospital, sadly. Um, she uh, was diagnosed with pneumonia and needed to go in so that she could get some more intense treatment than what she was capable of doing at home. So um, I will be heading over tomorrow uh, to um, pay her a visit. But in the meantime, you can lift her up in prayer and also keep her in your love. Um, and we will do that in prayer today. So, uh, oh, and we have uh, one more, which I almost, um, I, I need to. Let us also pray for Roger Zieber, um, Steve Zieber's dad, um, who, um, who is also uh, facing health issues and, um, and having difficulty right now. So, yes. Did Karen pass? Oh, okay. All right. So yes, we have um, on the prayer chain, we have we have uh, lifted up Dinah's sister, Karen. Um, and so let us keep both Karen and Dinah. And also speaking of Jackie, let us keep Lee in our prayers as well. Um, talk to me afterwards. All right, let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even even those words as simple as they are, don't truly capture all of our gratitude, all of our recognition for what you have done for us. God, we know that so often we fall short. We know that too often we give into temptation to just put a part of our lives in rather than jumping into the circle and putting our whole selves in to our commitment with you. Remind us, God, that oftentimes that commitment to live according to your love is not what we think. It doesn't mean having to come to church or pray or read our Bible all the time. What it means is just having your love as the filter through which we see our world, through which we make our decisions, through which we live our lives. Help us, God, to live as Jesus did, because truly this was his model for his earthly life. And it's one that we can follow as well. And so as we begin this new endeavor of being fully committed and being all in with you, God, we lift up the family of Jacob Wadsworth. We think of Vanessa and David and Jackie, and we ask that you would surround them and all of Jake's family and friends with your love and with your peace in their hearts. 
We pray the same God for all of Earl's family. family. Earl is now reunited with Virginia. They live in the land where your love is in abundance, where your love is all that there is. But we still in this world will miss them until we're reunited. And so we pray as they prepare to say goodbye to him this week, we pray that your love would surround them and your peace would be in their hearts as well. God, we pray for Jackie as she is even now in the hospital battling pneumonia. Jackie has had so many health issues, God. You know that this has worn her down. So we pray not only for physical healing for Jackie, but we pray that you would remind her of your presence, of the strength that she has when she leans on you. We pray also, God, for Lee and ask that you would lift him up as he walks with her down these difficult health journeys so faithfully and lovingly. We pray, God, for Roger, as he also struggles with health issues of his own. We pray that you would be with him and have your healing touch upon his body and upon his life. And God, we pray for Karen and for Dinah. You have prepared Karen to come home with you. She has battled cancer bravely. And God, as her time may be drawing near, we pray that she would recognize Jesus to come for her as he has promised. And we pray that she would have nothing but peace and joy in her heart as she leaves the body that has failed her and enters into the home that, of love and joy that you have prepared for her. And we pray for Dinah and for their mom and for their whole family as they walk these last days with Karen as well. In all ways, God, we know that you are with us. We know that whether we celebrate or whether we grieve, whether we experience happy times or sad times, you will never leave us nor forsake us. That is the message of love. It's the message spoken loudly through the cross and through the empty tomb. And it's the message shared through your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray and whose prayer we share together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us end our service in song with the first verse of one of my favorites as a fire is meant for burning. By the way, uh, Earl's life will be celebrated here at St. Paul's on Thursday. And uh, forgive me, I didn't pay close enough attention to the obituary, even though I ran it out. What time? 1030. Uh, there will also be visitation at Oxter's funeral home the night before. So um, uh, let us lift up this and, and, and all people in love. And as we leave this place, I pray that we do so prepared to jump into the circle, put our whole selves in for God, our time, our talents, our treasures, our whole life through the lens of love, committed to living the life that God has created for and following in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless us all. Mm -hmm.